Today, we embark on an exciting journey as we delve into the first episode of this highly anticipated series, Fallout. In the opening chapter of the series, we're introduced to a world on the brink of catastrophe, yet curiously untouched by it, at least for the moment. The scene is Los Angeles in the year 2077, a city that marries the nostalgic charm of the 1950s with the stark lines of futuristic architecture. Robots are as commonplace as household pets, quietly blending into the daily lives of the city's residents. At a child's birthday party, we meet Cooper Howard, a man playing the role of a cowboy, with his daughter Janie by his side. It's an unexpected sight for the gathered parents, who whisper and nudge, labeling Cooper a pinko, and speculating about his need to make alimony payments. As the party buzzes with subdued conversations and children's laughter, the television plays quietly in the background, the newscaster's voice almost lost among the chatter. Yet, his words hang ominously in the air, reflecting the nation's unease. The president is missing, and there's talk of bombs, a chilling reminder that the future may be all too uncertain. As Cooper mingles among the guests, snapping photos, one of the fathers eagerly requests Cooper's signature thumbs-up pose. However, Cooper's response is a firm no, a refusal that sparks curiosity. Later, as the party moves indoors for cake and an episode of Grognak the Barbarian, Cooper and Janie remain outside to tidy up. It's here, amid the remnants of celebration, that Janie queries her father about his earlier refusal. Cooper shares a grim piece of wisdom from his marine days. If a bomb drops, they were instructed to hold up a thumb. The size of the explosion against the thumb would determine their next move, smaller meant flee, and larger meant the futility of escape. The atmosphere shifts as Cooper heads inside to fetch some cake for Janie. Janie's eyes catch a distant flash, an ominous glow that pierces the festivities. Returning to reassure his daughter, Cooper dismisses it as a mere fire. But the night sky tells a different story as it brightens with the terrible bloom of explosions. Los Angeles reels under the assault of falling bombs. Panic ensues. Parents and children scramble toward shelters and cars. Amidst the chaos, Cooper and Janie leap onto their horse, galloping away from the encroaching disaster, racing against the collapse of the world they knew. The narrative then shifts dramatically to the year 2296, deep within the confines of Vault 33. Here, we find Lucy, a vibrant and multi-talented resident, presenting her credentials to the Vault's governing board. Despite her engagement in various activities, she's an active member of the Young Pipefitters Association, an avid gardener, and even runs a book club with her father Hank, who happens to be the overseer of the Vault. Lucy faces a personal dilemma. She has yet to find a suitable partner for marriage within the confines of their insulated world. In a bold move, Lucy submits an application to initiate a marriage arrangement with a resident of neighboring Vault 32. She hopes this proposal will not only fulfill her personal desires but also potentially benefit both communities. After careful consideration of her proposal and her contributions to the Vault, the board gives its consent. With their approval, Lucy begins to prepare for her upcoming nuptials, a mix of anticipation and excitement coloring her preparations as she steps toward a new chapter of her life. As Vault 33 bursts into a flurry of preparations, the community comes together to orchestrate a wedding unlike any other, right next to their lush indoor cornfields. The area is transformed with 3D cameras that project the serene images of a farmstead, crafting the illusion of an open-air ceremony under the sky. Hank, the overseer and father of the bride shares a poignant moment amidst the festivity, expressing a heartfelt wish that Lucy's mother could have witnessed their daughter's special day. The excitement builds as the residents of Vault 33 gather at the entrance to Vault 32, eager to meet their seldom-seen neighbors. The moment is charged with anticipation and curiosity. When Lucy meets Monty, her soon-to-be husband from Vault 32, her happiness is evident. Monty's handsome appearance and charming demeanor instantly win her over, and the following ceremony marks the joyful union of the two. However, amidst the celebrations, Lucy's brother, Norm, senses an undercurrent of tension. He observes the newcomers critically, noting their suspicious hunger, odd scars, and peculiar demeanor, which unsettled the otherwise joyful atmosphere. Meanwhile, 
Hank delivers a hopeful speech, suggesting that the lowering radiation levels might soon allow the next generation to reclaim and recolonize the surface of the Earth, a vision that adds a layer of hope to the day's profound celebrations. Shortly after the wedding, Monty, eager to start their new life together, invites Lucy to explore their future home within Vault 33. The newlyweds swiftly embark on an intimate journey, envisioning the future and their role in the continuation of humanity. Meanwhile, Lucy's brother, Norm, driven by a nagging suspicion, ventures towards Vault 32. There, he uncovers a grim scene, a wasteland of failed crops and, chillingly, a collection of dismembered bodies, revealing the dire state of their neighbors. Back in Vault 33, a startling discovery unfolds as Lucy and Monty conclude their private moments. Lucy's Pip-Boy, a sophisticated wrist-worn device providing critical data, alerts her to Monty's dangerously high radiation levels. The revelation is shocking. Monty is not who he claims to be. He's a raider from the surface. The realization precipitates a violent struggle between them. Monty, in a desperate act, stabs Lucy, but she, fueled by adrenaline and survival instinct, retaliate fiercely, slashing his face with shattered glass. Severely wounded but determined, Lucy administers a quick healing injection to herself and stumbles out to find Vault 33 in chaos, its residents under brutal attack. Summoning her strength, she rushes to the armory, arms herself with a tranquilizer gun, and joins the desperate defense. Amid this turmoil, Monty returns vengeful and more dangerous than ever. But Hank, Lucy's father, intervenes dramatically, subduing Monty with a shovel before ultimately ending his threat by drowning him in a pickle barrel. Despite their valiant efforts, the grim reality settles in, Vault 32's forces overwhelm them. Although the dwellers of Vault 33 put up fierce resistance, they face a bitter defeat, leaving their fate uncertain and their sanctuary breached. In a harrowing twist, the celebrations at Vault 33 give way to a dire situation as the leader of the raiders from Vault 32 captures several of Vault 33's residents. Among the captives are Lucy's pregnant friend Steph, who tragically lost her husband in the skirmish and suffered a gruesome injury when her eye was stabbed out with a fork, and Lucy's cousin Chet, who harbors unspoken feelings for Lucy. The tension escalates when the raider's leader confronts Hank, presenting him with a cruel ultimatum to choose between saving his daughter or the other captives. Amidst this standoff, Hank recognizes the raider's leader and confronts her identity, to which she chillingly responds, Everyone knows who I am. In a desperate act to protect his daughter, Hank forcibly hides Lucy in a closet, despite her protests, declaring with deep emotion, You are my world. As the situation spirals further out of control, the raiders subdue Hank with a tranquilizer ominously stating they are taking him to the real world. Before departing, the raider's leader looks at Lucy and remarks on her resemblance to her mother. She then coldly activates a bomb placed near the captives and exits, leaving the inhabitants of Vault 33 in a state of panic. In the moments that follow, as the bomb ticks down, the residents of Vault 33 scramble for safety. The explosion rocks the vault, marking a devastating turn in the story as the community faces the aftermath of betrayal and violence. Following the cataclysmic events, the narrative transports us to the surface, introducing us to Maximus, a fledgling member of the formidable military faction known as the Brotherhood of Steel. Tasked with securing the wasteland and salvaging pre-war technology for preservation, Maximus finds himself at the lower echelons of the Order. We first encounter him enduring a rough beating, followed by a humiliating critique from a teacher who scolds him for his lack of instant recognition of ancient relics. The monotony of the lesson is abruptly shattered by the arrival of an airship from which several Brotherhood members descend. Clad in the imposing T-60 power armor, they exude the aura of metallic warriors, a sight that leaves everyone in awe. Despite his fascination, Maximus's day continues to spiral downwards as he is assigned the unenviable task of latrine duty. However, his friend Dane pulls him away from this drudgery to explore the unused suits of armor. As they inspect the gear, Maximus is overwhelmed by memories of his childhood. He recalls the first time he saw the power armor and the lasting impact it had on him. The moment of nostalgia is cut short when Dane receives thrilling news. He has been selected to be anointed 
into the brotherhood as a squire. Left out of this honor, Maximus is visibly shaken and vents his frustration in solitude later that night. The following morning brings more turmoil. Dane discovers a razor hidden in their boot, which gruesomely slashes their leg. In a swift and alarming turn of events, high-ranking Brotherhood members apprehend Maximus, his head shrouded with a bag, dragging him away to an uncertain fate. The scene leaves a chilling impression of the harsh realities within the Brotherhood. In the aftermath of the celebrations, the inhabitants of Vault 33 face the daunting task of restoring their sanctuary. Amid the repairs, a bold poster is erected, proclaiming, The outside world can never hurt you! A stark reminder of their long-held isolation. During a crucial vault meeting, Lucy, fueled by determination and concern, proposes sending a search party to the surface to locate her father. Her suggestion, however, is swiftly dismissed. The outside world has been untouched by any from the vault for 219 years, and fear of the unknown runs deep. Norm, Lucy's brother, voices a suspicion that strikes a chord. Perhaps the leaders are reluctant to find their father because his return could threaten their authority. Undeterred by the resistance and supported by Norm and their friend Chet, Lucy makes her way to the vault's formidable door. She opens it with a mixture of trepidation and exhilaration to lay eyes on the outside world for the first time. The sight that greets her is desolate and awe-inspiring. The vast wasteland stretches before her, with the Santa Monica Pier looming as a distant silhouette against the harsh landscape. Fueled by resolve and the hope of finding her father, Lucy steps into the unknown, embarking on a quest that promises to change her life forever. The scene shifts back to Maximus under the heavy gaze of Brotherhood Elder Cleric Quintus. In a charged exchange, Quintus probes into Maximus's reasons for joining the Brotherhood. Maximus's response is raw and honest. To hurt the people who hurt me. The tension escalates as Quintus confronts him with suspicions regarding an attack on Dane, a fellow member recently elevated above Maximus. Despite Maximus's denial of involvement, Quintus sees him as a prime suspect due to the promotion. Quintus sternly reminds Maximus that violence is a sign of weakness within the Brotherhood, a statement that sparks a defiant resolve in Maximus. He counters, affirming his strength and expressing gratitude towards the Brotherhood for providing him a refuge and a purpose when he was most vulnerable. I'm willing to give my life and thanks for giving me meaning. He declares a sentiment that captures his deep loyalty and gratitude. As their intense meeting concludes, Quintus drops a revelation, Maximus will step into Dane's role while they recover from their injuries. Visiting Dane later, Maximus is met with reassurance. Dane confides that there is still a place in the Brotherhood for them once they heal and shares that they have defended Maximus's character, telling others he is incapable of such violence, asserting, he couldn't hurt a fly. This gesture of trust and support adds layers to their complex relationship hinting at deeper bonds and shared values within the Brotherhood. Following his promotion, Maximus undergoes a solemn ceremony, a rite of passage that marks his new status within the Order. As part of the ritual, he receives a branding on the back of his neck, a distinct T symbol that signifies his elevated role. No sooner is the ceremony concluded than Maximus is tasked with his first major assignment, a mission that will test his mettle and dedication. Accompanied by a cadre of fellow knights and their eager squires, Maximus sets out on a high-stakes quest. Their target is a fugitive, a former resident of a secretive and influential group called the Enclave. This individual is not just an escapee. He possesses an artifact of immense potential whose capabilities could sway the balance of power in their fragile world. As the teams prepare for departure, they gather for a final briefing. Here, Maximus is shown a reconstructed image of the man they will track down, a figure shadowed by mystery and urgency. Beside the man in the picture is his companion, a loyal dog, adding another layer to the enigma they must unravel. With the image etched in his mind, Maximus and his group head into the expanse known as the Wilds, each team assigned a different sector to comb through in their search for the elusive pair. The mission promises danger and discovery as they delve into the untamed remnants of a world that once was. In the climactic finale of the episode, the scene shifts to a lonely graveyard under the cover of night. Here, 
a trio of rugged bounty hunters led by the enigmatic Hancho are on a peculiar mission. Their target is buried beneath the earth, a feral ghoul known for its danger and unpredictability. An eerie sight meets their eyes as they excavate the grave. Four tubes dangle from a makeshift cross, trailing into the grave's depths. As the digging continues, a shocking revelation unfolds. The ghoul inside the grave resembles Cooper Howard, linking past to present in an unexpected twist. Hancho presents the ghoul with a calculating gaze, now known as the ghoul, with an irresistible offer, one final bounty hunt. This mission involves tracking a fugitive from the enclave, now headed towards California, the ghoul's alleged homeland. The ghoul, ever the loner and drawn to the thrill rather than the reward, coolly assesses the situation. In a swift and surprising turn, he eliminates Hancho's two companions, declaring this hunt his final escapade. He sends Hancho tumbling into the grave they had unearthed for him with a defiant throw. As the dust settles on this dramatic confrontation, the ghoul prepares to pursue the runaway solo, driven by his enigmatic reasons and the lure of the chase, marking a gritty end to a thrilling episode. The first episode of Fallout masterfully lays the groundwork for a rich narrative tapestry in just an hour. The story weaves in crucial information and tantalizes viewers by leaving much to their imagination while introducing three characters, each with a distinct perspective on their dystopian reality. Director Jonathan Nolan, alongside writers Geneva Robertson Warrett and Graham Wagner, skillfully captures the essence of the original game, a blend of terror, unpredictability, dark humor, and bleakness. From the gripping opening scenes depicting the initial moments of destruction to the bizarre and intense skirmish between the dwellers of Vault 33 and a band of raiders, the episode encapsulates the essence that has made the Fallout universe compelling for many years. It teases the expansive possibilities of life in the wasteland, setting the stage for a series filled with potential and intrigue.